Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our event to mark the launch of the 2024 Lowy Institute poll. As is customary, we begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm Sam Rogovine, Director of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute. And we're here tonight to mark the 2024 edition of the Lowy Institute poll. The purpose of the poll, which is almost as old as the Institute itself, is to learn about what Australians think about the world and Australia's place in it. Alan Gingell, the first executive director of the Lowy Institute and much missed since his passing last year, said that the poll was conceived because there had previously been no reliable way to track what Australians thought about critical international issues, and nor was there any way to know how these views changed. Well, we're 20 additions into the poll now, so we've filled that gap, and Alan rightly called the Lowy Institute poll an extraordinary national resource. Now, my job tonight will be to ask some questions of our panellists, who I'll introduce shortly, and also to facilitate a conversation with all of you. But first, I'm delighted to offer the floor to Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honourable Tim Watts MP, who joins us to open this event. Tim Watts is the Federal Member for Jellybrand and has served in his foreign affairs role since 2022. He was first elected to the House of Representatives in 2013. Before entering Parliament, Tim worked in the technology sector and as a lawyer and as a senior advisor to the Victorian Premier. He's the author of two books and as one of the most well-travelled members of the federal parliament, I dare say he's collecting material for a third. In fact, I believe Tim has just returned from a G20 meeting in Brazil, so we're grateful to have him with us today. Would you please welcome the Assistant Minister, Tim Watts, to the stage. Well, thank you for that introduction, Sam. And let me begin also by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present and extend those respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are with us here today. Let me also acknowledge uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps in attendance tonight um, and senior, uh, uh, senior public servants from uh, DFAT and other agencies uh, in Canberra here today. Um, also just offer a personal reflection. Last time I was standing um, at, this, uh, at this lectern, uh, I was speaking in opposition and in the front row was Alan Gingell, um, who asked me a very uh, insightful question about a uh, cyber security book that he had been reading at the time. And I just thought, this is a great tribute to a doyen of Australian foreign policy that uh, he was taking time out of his life to listen to a mere member of the opposition <laughs> and asking questions about a frontier of international relations. Um, it's one of uh, my personal favourite memories, so thank you. Um, let me begin by uh, congratulating the Lowy Institute um, on the 20th edition of its poll, Surveying Australian Attitudes to the World. The Lowy poll remains the preeminent source of longitudinal data uh, for understanding how the Australian public sees the world around us. It's an invaluable body of work um, that befits the role that Lowy Institute plays in informing our national foreign policy debate. The Lowy poll provides a fascinating track of how Australian public opinion has evolved in the face of the enormous changes in our external circumstances that we have seen over the last two decades. Now, while the poll is a rich source of material for foreign policy commentators and analysts, it leaves me as a minister and as a politician at a slight disadvantage in giving this speech. For a politician, of course, the first rule of polling is not to talk about polling. Well, on the record at least. There are many good reasons uh, for me to leave the editorialising of the specific ins and outs of this poll to the commentators. But let me share with you some high level reflections of the findings of this year's poll with you today. As the Foreign Minister has said, in the Albanese government, our foreign policy must be an accurate and authentic reflection of our values and interests, of who we are and of what we want. 
Now, in this way, we regularly say that under the Albanese government, our foreign policy begins with our national identity. And that now, to me, our identity is best characterised by what that great Indigenous leader, Noel Pearson, has described as the three stories that make us one as Australians. The story of 65,000 years of Indigenous heritage, which is its foundation. The story of our Westminster institutions built upon that foundation and the story of our multicultural migration that has so enriched our nation in recent decades. So that today, half of Australians are either born overseas or have a parent born overseas. Now, Australia's modern national identity is an obvious source of influence for Australian foreign policy. It's a superpower for our engagement with the world. As a country where half of us were either born overseas or has a parent born overseas, anyone anywhere in the world can look to Australia and see something of themselves reflected. And at the same time, we can look within our own nation um, and find a point of understanding, a point of connection uh, with anyone anywhere in the world. But this source, this modern national identity isn't just a source of international influence, it also informs our values and interests and the strategic priorities that flow from them. And in this context, the Lowy Poll contributes to our understanding of who we are, what we want and how we as a people see the world. Strikingly, it shows extraordinary and enduring public support for Australia's diverse modern identity. The poll reports that, quote, Australians are overwhelmingly positive about Australia's cultural diversity. Nine in 10 Australians think Australia's culturally diverse population has been either mostly positive or entirely positive for Australia. And this is one finding that hasn't changed in the life of the Lowy Poll. And frankly, I think this finding is something that could be easily overlooked as it's something that's become so fundamental to our national identity that many Australians take it for granted. But it's a finding that has implications as much for how we conduct our foreign policy as much as it does for what we seek to achieve through it. As the Lowy Poll confirms, Australia's modern diversity is now a fundamental, deeply cherished dimension of our national identity, but it's not just the scale of our connection to the world that's grown over the lifetime of the Lowy Poll. So too as the intensity of this connection. The Australian people are directly connected to the world around us with both its opportunities and with its traumas in ways that would have been unimaginable to previous generations. Families are connected by transnational group chats. Diasporas are connected by social media networks. Cultures are connected by international streaming platforms. As a result, the stakes of events overseas are felt more intensely by many Australians than in the past. And as a result, the Australian government's response to these events are even more intensely scrutinised across multiple fronts. Given the diversity of our society, it's inevitable that Australians will often disagree on these intensely felt issues with each other and with their elected representatives. And these disagreements can be exacerbated by the new political and media ecosystem that fuels polarisation and empowers extreme voices. It's in this context that we say that preserving our social cohesion as a nation is a priority of the way that we do foreign policy. As I said earlier, this is as much about how we do things as is what, about what we are trying to achieve. Social cohesion is as much a process as it is an end state. It's not about seeking unity through homogene homogeneity of opinion. It's about recognising that Australia is a diverse, pluralistic society and that we will always have differences of view, but that despite this, what we have in common as Australians matters more. Despite our differences, we have more in common. That no matter any individual disagreement, we have a shared future as Australians, and every citizen has a stake in the success of our nation. That our shared successes relies on us being able to work together in our diversity, in our schools, in our universities, in our workplaces, in our sporting teams, in our local communities, even with people who may disagree with us. And that because of this, there's value in disagreeing respectfully and listening empathetically to those with different views. Because regardless of the issue, there's a bigger picture that unites us. Now in this context, the Lowy Poll's findings of, on Australian attitudes to our democracy have for many years provided a salutary warning. One of the things that unites us, all of us as Australians, is a shared commitment to democratic values. The second pillar of Noel Pearson's conception of Australian identity. 
Now, despite this, many of us are worried about the health of our democracy. And we're acting on this as a government. It's why we're taking action to address these challenges through our Strengthening Democracy Task Force, our Counter Foreign Interference Task Force, and our newly announced Tech Fit, the Technology Foreign Interference Task Force. It's why we're acting through our whistleblower reforms, through our upcoming reforms to political donations and electoral spending, and through the establishment of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. We're also taking steps to ensure that every Australian feels safe and included in our democracy through initiatives like the appointment of our envoys to counter anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and the appointment of Peter Khalil as special convoy, uh, envoy for social cohesion. This is important work, but let me emphasise to you what I emphasise to every school group that I speak to at Parliament House. Our democracy belongs to all of us as Australians. We all have agency in how it operates. We all have a choice in how we exercise our democratic rights and how we treat our fellow citizens. A choice of whether to listen rather than to shout, to show empathy rather than contempt, to seek to understand rather than to instinctively condemn. Usefully, the Lowy poll gives us some ballast to our understanding of Australian public opinion in this respect. A consistent finding of the Lowy Poll's 20-year history is how few Australians position themselves on the extremes of the spectrum of opinion offered by the poll's questions. It's a reminder that while the extremes may be loud, the bulk of Australian public opinion remains in the middle ground. In this way, it's a reminder that it's a mistake to empower the extremes expressed in our political debate by giving them undue weight and attention that it's a mistake to assume that the most extreme voice that you might see on social media is an accurate rep representation of the bulk of the people with a different view to yours. That it's a mistake to buy into their artificial binaries and to allow their tactics of division and polarisation to become a self-fulfilling prophecy for our community. I've had thousands of conversations with Australians about foreign policy in my role and very few of them match the caricatures that you see on social media or our more excitable news outlets. <laughs> Apologies to any that may be in attendance. <laughs> the loud and the visible extremes do not represent the way that most Australians engage with these issues. The vast majority of Australians don't assume that their fellow Australians are acting in bad faith or project the worst possible motives onto their words or actions. Similarly, the vast majority of Australians don't think that terrible things happening on the other side of the world justifies treating fellow citizens in Australia terribly. Australians understand that we face complex and consequential challenges in our engagement with the world, but they also understand that the importance of ensuring these international challenges do not divide us into acrimony at home. The overwhelming majority of Australians love the country that we've built together and the three stories that make us one of Austra as Australians. They're proud of it. We're proud of our Indigenous heritage. We treasure our democratic values and we've embraced our modern multicultural identity. Now, amidst all of the changes in our international circumstances over the last 20 years, the way that we see ourselves as Australians and as a nation has remained consistent through the life of the Lowy Poll. So as I hand over to the panel, the analysts and the audience for today's conversation, I want to leave you with this thought. There's plenty to discuss and to debate and to disagree about in the findings of this latest Lowy poll and in Australia's engagement with the world more broadly. But regardless of these differences, all of us in this room and beyond have more in common as Australians than the things that divide us. I'm looking forward to listening to a fantastic discussion of the panelists tonight. Thank you all for coming. And thank you to the Lowy Institute for an outstanding public resource. Right, well, thank you to Tim Watts for that uh, introduction. I, I think if I may, Ryan, it's a tribute to you as the author of the poll, but also to your predecessors in that role that um, uh, that's created the kind of reputation that the poll now has, uh, that someone of um, 
uh, of Tim's stature would be here to open uh, our event, our discussions this evening. So thank you, Tim. And um, uh, we also look forward to the to the discussion to come. So th there is a lot to talk about this evening. There's uh, the US-China relationship, climate and energy, <coughs> India, on which we have new data, and the threat perceptions of Australians, which the poll measures every year. Uh, also immigration and multiculturalism, which uh, Tim spoke about. Uh, and of course, I want to get to all of your questions. So I'd like to begin now by introducing my colleagues up on the stage. I should briefly note, some of you will have seen in your advertising that uh, Avani Dias from the ABC was going to join us on the panel for this event. Unfortunately, she is absent due to illness. But let me begin by introducing Ryan Nealam, uh, Director of the Public Opinion and Foreign Policy Program at the Lowy Institute and project lead on the Lowy Institute poll. Prior to joining the Lowy Institute, Ryan spent 14 years as an Australian diplomat. He was most recently Australia's Deputy Consul General in Hong Kong and acted as head of the consulate during an extended period of political upheaval there. Ryan was also posted to the Australian mission in the UN in New York, where he represented Australia on global economic, climate change and human rights issues. He was a key Australian negotiator of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and he served on Australia's UN Security Council team during the 2013-2014 term. And to my immediate right is Michelle Lyons, who is Research Fellow in the Lowy Institute's Indo-Pacific Development Centre, where she works on international climate change policy and climate <coughs> finance. She has more than a decade of experience working uh, in the public service and at the Australian National University on climate change policy. Michelle is a member of the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions. She's completing her PhD at ANU, in fact, in for all intents and purposes, has completed uh, on uh, the roles of public investment in the transition to net zero emissions. Michelle is a recipient of the prestigious Sir Roland Wilson Scholarship. Would you please welcome our panelists? <clears throat> so Ryan, starting with you, uh, just to ground our discussion this evening, can you outline for us the top two or three big trends in the two decade history of the poll? Sure, and thank you for the introduction, Sam, and to Minister Watts for the for the warm uh, opening. Uh, look, it's been a when we look back over the history of the poll, there's so much data in it, but three things really stand out to me. The first uh, is on China. It's quite clear when you look at the data across the history of, of, of the poll, that Australian attitudes have undergone a dramatic reversal. So when we started polling in 2005, you can, sent that you can see a sense of optimism about China's rise, about the uh, economic potential and the economic potential of the relationship um, come through in the poll. And that carried through well into the, the, the next decade. So in 2016, um, Australians ranked China as Australia's best friend in Asia. Now, of course, we've had a very rocky period in relations since then, uh, and uh, particularly in the last few years, we saw the official relationship uh, undergo many challenges. There was a lot of media, public rhetoric, and, uh, and of course, China has changed uh, dra dramatically over that period too. Um, and now we see uh, Australian trust in China at very low levels and threat perceptions uh, have remained at, at very high levels. So that's, uh, that's one of the major changes is a reversal in how Australians look to our major trading partner. Um, secondly, I'd point to the way uh, that Australians perceive threats facing the nation. That's changed dramatically as well. When we started polling, Australians were concerned about international terrorism. Uh, they were concerned about the, uh, the, the threat of climate change. Uh, and they were they were concerned about uh, the uh, n the prospect of nuclear proliferation. When we look at the threats that top the list now, it's cyber attacks number one, uh, and then uh, numbers two and three are the threat of conflict in our own region, in whether it's over Taiwan or in the South China Sea. So those threats are now closer to home and uh, and seem a lot more uh, clear and present than uh, than than uh, when we look back over the history. And then the third thing I'd point out is, and, and this is more of stability, but uh, stability in uh, how we look at the views, how we look towards the US, the United States, um, in, in that 
Australians on the one hand have uh, have always seen the uh, US alliance, the, our alliance with the United States as key to our own security. But at the same time, we've always had misgivings and, and seen risk in where that alliance may lead us. So at the start of the poll, it was uh, concern about the war in Iraq. Now it's concern about whether we'll be drawn into a war in Asia. And I'll go, we'll, we can go into more, each of those in more detail. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, Ryan. And um, you you mentioned uh, climate change amongst those issues of threats. So, Shell, let me turn to you then, and specifically your field of climate change. 20 years of data now to uh, to draw on about Australian attitudes. What can we conclude? And I'm, I'm particularly interested to know about the link between the cost of living in Australia <coughs> and support for costly measures to reduce climate emissions. Thanks, Sam. Um, well, I think uh, it was really interesting looking over the, the poll data this year because there was a slight incongruence between the way Australia perceived their, their international role um, in sort of fighting climate change versus what they see the government's role um, being at home. And so for, for 20 years, we've asked a, a question um, which sort of looks at what Australia and the, the world should be doing to address climate change. And it has three broad options. And so one is that, you know, climate change is a very serious problem, that it needs to be dealt with immediately, um, and that that needs to occur even recognising that that will be expensive. The second option is a, a sort of more measured um, uh, statement that says, you know, climate change is important, but we don't need to worry about taking sort of significant action for a while yet. And the third option is a more sceptical statement that um, questions whether or not Australia and the world need to do anything on climate. And so I'd say, you know, first off, that that sceptical statement over the 20 years of the poll has had very low support across the Australian public. So it's a very small uh, group of people that are sceptical um, of the need to take action on climate change. But what we have seen since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, almost 10 years ago, was that there has been a majority of Australians that agree with that first statement, that we need to take a sort of significant action on climate change and that they, rec they recognise that there will be costs in doing so. Um, and so then it was interesting this year because we uh, also asked a question about, you know, well, what, um, what should the government uh, in Australia, what should their main focus be on climate and energy? And just a couple of years ago, uh, there was a clear majority of Australians, 55%, who thought that the Australian government should be focused primarily on reducing emissions. But this year, we saw a shift where there is now almost a majority, or 48% of people, that think that the Australian government's focus should be on, um, uh, uh, not uh, on reducing emissions, but on reducing the, the cost of household energy bills. And I mean, I don't think that that would be a surprise to anybody in this room because there's been, you know, a number of um, sort of significant drivers of increases in household energy bills um, that are, you know, mostly factors outside government controls like supply chain issues due to COVID, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, the, the final sort of areas of climate that I found really interesting uh, was that there was very strong support from the Australian public uh, for Australia increasing its uh, emissions reduction target uh, through the United Nations next year, and also very strong support for Australia hosting the United Nations conference in, in uh, 2026. Um, but I think uh, that incongruence between the, that international and domestic perception makes uh, makes for a hard path for, for governments um, and pol public servants to, to follow. Of course, one of the difficulties of polling is to get a sense from the public we can get an idea of how important something is over time, but what's harder to do is to get an idea of how important it is relative to people's other priorities, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, Ryan, maybe you could say a little bit about that, but also um, t uh, Tim mentioned that it can be uh, difficult for, uh, for politicians to talk about polling. Here's an issue that is going to cause a little uh, friction between the parties because... One of the results that got a lot of attention this year was the response to nuclear power as a source of energy. So could you maybe comment on, on, on both sure. of those issues? Yeah, sure. On the first uh, issue, I mean, yeah, polling uh, is amorphous in that if you ask one question, you can get one response. You ask a question in a different way and you can get a completely contradictory answer, right? So what's useful and what we try to do through the poll is ask some questions about the trade-offs, which is what right. Shell referred to on um, do people see the main priority of government being energy bills, 
reducing emissions or reducing the risk of blackouts. And, and over that time, you can see where priorities shift. It doesn't mean that uh, because people feel the cost of living pinch um, more in the current environment that they don't care about reducing emissions. It just shows that the priorities shift over time and that there are different emphases as we, as we move through different contexts. Um, but on nuclear, I mean, this is, we asked about uh, people's levels of support for a range of different energy sources and nuclear was one we came back to this year where over 60% of the public said that they see, uh, that they think um, that, that they would be supportive of nuclear as part of Australia's overall energy mix alongside renewables. Just let me interrupt, was this yep. before or after the opposition announced its support for nuclear power? The policy had been broadly announced, but it, the detail had, um, the, the kind of detailed announcements had, hadn't come through. So citing all of those sorts of things came after our field work. Yep. Um, and it's a strong contrast when we look back at other questions, different questions over a decade ago in the wake of Fukushima, where there was a lot uh, less support or actually majority opposition to nuclear power as part of Australia's push to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, and for obvious reasons, coming off the back of Fukushima, the safety concerns were clear and present. Um, but what I will say, I mean, it does look like there is now um, broad openness in the Australian public towards nuclear, but we've only asked one question about what they think about it being part of the mix. We didn't go into depth about the, the, the cost of nuclear, the time frame it would take to actually stand up a civilian nuclear agency. And those are the sorts of questions that we should be seeking advice from economists and scientists about how they, how various energy options can play a role in reducing our emissions. So I think there's a, there's a debate to be had. But what the value of that question is that it shows that the public has um, a, a, a positive or open attitude towards nuclear as a source of energy. They also uh, have strong support for renewables. The government's renewable energy target uh, has uh, strong majority support there. And, uh, and coal has changed completely um, from uh, now a majority oppose uh, opening new coal mines, exporting coal. So there's a lot of change there in the energy results of the poll. If, if I can be permitted one observation, actually, one, one thing that surprised me about the AUKUS debate in Australia is how little of it has centred on uh, the nuclear reactors in these submarines. I, I had expected that to be uh, an issue of real friction around mm. AUKUS. Now, perhaps that's still to come, particularly when uh, at some point in the future the government announces uh, an East Coast base for the submarines. But perhaps I had overestimated uh, how much of a... Uh, well, a third rail of politics, this, this whole idea of having nuclear reactors is that the, the public is more relaxed about this technology, although historically, as you say, Fukushima would tend to suggest that we do jump around a bit on that issue. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised not to see more opposition, not, not that there hasn't been opposition to AUKUS, the nuclear component, but I think the, um, the, the, that, that it wasn't the dominant sort of stream of the debate. And I, and I will say, I think there's a lot more debate to be run on AUKUS um, because we, we ask at a broad level about levels of support for acquiring submarines. You start to scratch under the surface, you ask about cost the impact of AUKUS on the region, on regional stability, and there's a lot more variation between um, the responses we get. So um, look, you can kind of drill down further into these questions, and I think it's useful to do that um, as we go through polling. Glad to hear there's more debate to come on AUKUS. I'd be out of a job if <laughs> um, Now, Ryan, you, you, you highlighted in your first response how drastically Australian attitudes towards China have changed over the past two decades. Let's drill down into that a little bit. We saw sentiments start to drop from about 2018 and mm. it hit rock bottom in 2021, 2022. And now since the Albanese government took office, we've had uh, two years of a relationship stabilisation is I think the term the government prefers. Uh, ha has that moved the needle on public perceptions? Yeah, look, uh, I mean, to use our colleague Richard McGregor's term, the, the relationship is stabilising but not stable. And we, in a sense, see public opinion reflect that. So um, Australians remain wary of China. There's um, been a slight uptick in levels of trust. I wouldn't overstate it. It's gone from 12% at, at its lowest point in 2022 to just 17% now. So that's not a rever reversion to what we had um, in uh, six years ago when more than half the population said they trusted China. So it's still very low levels of trust. When we look at threat perceptions, there are still more, more than uh, 
70% of Australians who see China as a potential military threat in the next 20 years. So that that's stayed pretty steady as well, despite the stabilising official relationship. So uh, in a sense, we see you know a, a cautiousness amongst the Australian public that I think um, shows that we are in a different stage rather than a, a, a re revert to what we had um, when we started polling and over the decade since. So this is a new normal then, maybe? It's hard to, I mean, we've only got a couple of years, yeah. but, but it looks like on some of our indicators that it's stable at a low level on trust and threat perceptions have stable, stabilised at a higher level. So to, to both of you, uh, to either of you, what can policymakers like Tim Watts learn from this poll about how Australians see that, that China relationship going forward? Um, well, I think um, that it, it sort of shows um, just, you know, how um, public opinion can shift very quickly um, uh, and that, you know, that once trust has been lost, it can take a, a you know, that can either be irreversible or take a, a long while to maintain. So I think... Um, yeah, I would absolutely agree with um, with Ryan that you know it's it's early days to see whether this is yeah this is going to be sort of a new normal or not. Um, yeah, I, I would add that just on we asked a new question this year on uh, do Australians place greater importance on maintaining a stable relationship with China or on working with allies to deter China's use of military force, and that that is kind of at the heart of many of the the, the, the relationship challenge that we have here and. Uh, the results kind of just show that we're, we're in a new period where there's no consensus on the way forward. Slightly more than 50% of Australians said stability should be the priority. Slightly less than half said that uh, deterrence should be the priority. So there's a real um, disjunct there. There are competing tensions that are pulling in different directions. And the government has the unenviable task of trying to manage those, looking out for our interests while keeping open areas of cooperation with China, which we need on a whole range of issues. All right, well, Shell, let's turn to the US now. And of course, should just say that the polling was conducted well before the drama of, in the US <laughs> election campaign of the last few weeks. But looking at the US results, what, what are the long term trends in public perceptions of the alliance? Uh, the poll showed that uh, support for Donald Trump is the highest for any Republican candidate in history. Broadly, what does that tell us about Australian views uh, around the US election? Well, thanks, Sam. I, I, mean, I guess on the first issue around uh, the Australian support for the US alliance, I mean, this has been one of the most consistent features of the poll over the 20 years um, that it's been running. You know, whether it's de Democratic or Republican administrations, there's a strong level of support between 70 and 80 per cent. Um, but I would say that while that support is strong, uh, like climate change, there's some incongruence in some of the other results. Um, so this year, I was really interested to see that the question I think that Ryan touched on earlier, where uh, you know there was a, uh, uh, Australians were asked whether you know the U.S. alliance might mean that Australia was drawn into a war in Asia as a result of the, of the alliance that was not in their national interest. And so, while 83 percent I think uh, supported the alliance, only 70 uh, there was 75 percent of people who thought that that was the case that we might be drawn into a war that was against our national interest. So, I mean, that's interesting. Um, on Donald Trump, uh, yes, he does have the highest support of any Republican uh, candidate in the history of the poll. Um, but I would say that that also comes off a low base. And one of the sort of consistent aspects of the poll has been, you know, majority Australian support for Democratic candidate, to candidates across the 20, uh, 20 years. So um, Obama, Clinton, and others. Um, where I sort of drilled down a little bit into some of the, the demographics uh, for uh, support for Trump. And, you know, many of these are similar with his uh, support base in the US, so uh, more popular with men. Um, on a, a national basis, uh, you know, it's a Canberra audience that we have here tonight, and I thought some people might be interested that uh, support for Donald Trump is actually lowest in the ACT of any of Australia. <laughs> so, I'm shocked. Um, <laughs> I, I will, will not speculate on why that may be. Um, Ryan, another aspect, of course, of the, of the relationship with the United States, uh, another big new uh, part of the alliance is is AUKUS, of course, which mm. we touched on briefly already. Um, the agreement to build eight nuclear-powered submarines for the Royal Australian Navy, but also to uh, deepen cooperation on other leading-edge military technologies. This is now the second year that we've polled on AUKUS. Third. 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 Yeah. The year that we've polled on AUKUS. And 
the support is still pretty solid, right? Yeah, 65% of Australians say they support the acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines. And when we first polled three years ago, it was 70%. So there's a you know, slight uh, drop, but not, uh, not hugely consequential. I think that's still um, clear majority support for acquiring these submarines. But what I alluded to earlier was our polling last year where we asked more questions about um, the cost of AUKUS, and, and most Australians felt that the cost was... Um, was not worth the capability and and then secondly a question on the impact that having these subs would have on our region and that's where you see just results all over the place nothing clear but um, you know some people saying that it's going to increase uh, regional instability others saying it will increase stability and then a huge amount of people more than 50 percent saying they either didn't know or weren't sure so um, that big non-response to me indicates that this debate is in a very early stage. Australians have sort of grasped maybe the, the, the high level contours that we're getting these, these more capable submarines, that that may be a good thing for our um, military capability. But then how that plays out, what the impact on our economy is, how we make it happen and what the, how the region receives it are all things that are sort of in the blurry future. I'm tempted to editorialise here, but I'll leave that for the audience. I'll only say, actually, that public awareness of AUKUS I find really impressive. Um, in the previous polls, no more than 8% said that they had not heard of AUKUS, which mm. seems an extraordinary number to me for such a new initiative. Um, so I wanted to turn to one of the new questions in the poll this year, uh, Ryan, on India. You, you asked Australians to prioritise three key issues in that relationship. And interestingly, Australians rank trade and investment as the highest priority, followed by human rights, and defence cooperation was ranked last. Can you unpack all of that? Yeah. Look, we, we haven't uh, done a huge amount of polling on India in the past, and we thought it was time that we actually start to gather some more data on this very important relationship. And um, one way we try to get at it is looking at these, these three big issues in the relationship. Um, on the trade and economic front, the, the fact that that was rated highest amongst um, Australians was, you know, I think it reflects the sense that India is, it, it, Australians still see great potential in India as an economic partner and that that has, hasn't fully been realised yet. Um, and that there's a lot more rise left in India, um, whereas China may be encountering um, great economic challenges at home. Uh, India uh, is still sort of the, the the untapped giant, and that there's a lot a lot more we can do with that. But um, there's also the aspect of economic diversification, which we know after the the coercive measures that China put it against Australia over the last few years, there was a a, a look out to where else we could. Um, insulate ourselves with other partners and India was the obvious answer for many but not always a successful one in terms of diversifying where we sent our products so that, so that's the trade and economic front and it's no surprise I think that that comes pretty high when when Australians think about India um, but human rights has been I think rising in in prominence when Australians think about the relationship uh, there's been reports from human rights groups, media um, that have uh, pointed out the rising illiberalism in the Indian political environment, um, Hindu nationalism, uh, constraints on freedom of the press, uh, er erosion of free speech. Um, there's been a number of instances. One of our uh, our a fellow panelist who was going to be here actually uh, was essentially essentially left India after reporting on Modi and didn't have a visa renewed. So there's, there's, there's issues there, I think, that are filtering through to how the Australian public um, see India, and it's not all good, right? So there's the potential, but there's, mis there's concerns there as well. Um, and then on the strategic space, that came lowest out of the three issues, which I think reflects that even though uh, the government is clearly very focused on India as a potential partner in balancing China's growing um, growing military might in the region. Uh, India, uh, th that hasn't flown through to the, the public consciousness net. They still don't see uh, India as a, uh, as, as a natural strategic partner, and there's probably more to be done on communications there. And where does Modi fit into all this, Prime Minister yeah. Modi? Yeah, so Modi, uh, I mean, he, he slipped seven points this year. So uh, 30, I think 37%, if I haven't got that figure wrong, is the uh, number of uh, the, the percentage of Australians who have confidence in Modi to do the right thing. So that's pretty low. And that's about the same. We, we see 
um, India and Indonesia both kind of underperforming in our in, across our indicators when it comes to trust in the country and confidence in the leadership. Um, so Modi uh, went down. Trust in India was sort of low in the middle band, uh, and that's really struggled to break above uh, uh, into the the higher levels of trust that we see for countries like Japan uh, in the poll. So there's a there's a real disjunct there between the sense of India's potential. Uh, it's a it's uh, the importance that we place on the relationship and how the public conceptualise this emerging power. Shell, did you want to say something about the parallels with Indonesia? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I was actually really interested to see the, the two um, results for, um, for uh, Modi and uh, uh, Joko um, Widodo because I think I would have expected um, uh, uh, Widodo's results to be higher, um, even though they historically haven't been. But there's been, you know, a lot of um, press this year about, you know, he's f finishing up his, his final term, and um, you know, at, under uh, his presidency, Indonesia has reached middle income country status, uh, which has, you know, uh, and, and there's been a lot of um, positive sort of outcomes um, in the, you know, the Australia-Indonesia relationship, including, you know, a very successful ASEAN um, summit earlier this year. So I think. Um, that's sort of an interesting um, area to watch. And I, you know, as um, we scale up our climate change engagement with Indonesia quite significantly, I'll be interested to sort of see, you know, how those results change in coming years. Now, final question for you, Shell, before I open it up to everybody. So please um, have your questions ready. The, and, th and this is the, the issue that, um, that uh, Tim Watts spoke about in his introduction. The poll records that roughly half of respondents say, migrant intake to Australia is too high and half say it's either about right or too low. <clears throat> Excuse me, it also shows overwhelmingly positive attitudes to cultural diversity. Only, <clears throat> excuse me, only 10% said Australia's culturally diverse population has been mostly or entirely negative for Australia. So how do you reconcile those two things, which might at least on the surface look contradictory? Yeah, well, I won't um, spend too long on this because I don't think I could add much to the, the minister's really thoughtful um, and um, excellent remarks. But I guess um, from my perspective, I think, you know, I look at that that question around, you know, the um, effects of multiculturalism. And it's one of those results every year that makes me proud to be Australian because I think, you know, we... Um, have provided, you know, opportunities for generations of migrants to come here and build a better life for, for themselves and for their families. And we've had, you know, relatively successful experience of, of sort of integrating those different communities into our country and building social cohesion. Um, but as Tim said, you know, that's not something that we can, can take for granted um, over the, the long term, and that's an ongoing process. And I think um, that other, the second question actually sort of sends a, a bit of a, a warning signal um, that, you know, uh, over time, uh, people uh, are less generous about, you know, migration when they feel like they might be moving backwards themselves. And so when you actually look at that data and you segment it by, by low income Australians, there's a much higher proportion of low income Australians who are less supportive of migration. And so I think, you know, that really sends a, a warning signal to, to policymakers um, and, and um, parties on both sides of politics that, you know, that, that that project of social cohesion is actually also rooted in, you know, helping to make our society as, as equal um, as it can be. All right. Could, could I just add to that yeah, before we move to questions? Uh, I think there's also um, a disjunct when you look at, uh, when you ask people through the prism of identity about um, immigration and multiculturalism, people conceptualise themselves uh, it's conceptualized the country and our society as multicultural um, but when you ask about a specific policy measure such as immigration then it's a, a bit quite quite a bit more divided as this poll shows but I mean throughout the poll we've seen that sort of division between identity and then the sort of specific policies particularly when it comes to economic issues um, cost of living crowded cities those things tend to 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 uh, give you a more mixed bag of results but um, but but there's always um, been a very strong uh, sense that we are better as a nation because of immigration and that it's essential to who we are we actually had a question like that a few years ago and again very strong um, uh, response that we are immigration is essential to Australia's identity <clears throat> right well sorry for my scratchy throat I've got to stop sleeping in the park <laughs> but uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> the first question is to uh, Alex Bristow. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, Alex Bristow from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. It comes as no surprise my question's about China, but um, uh, just looking at your, um, your data here, um, do you think the way that the relationship is framed uh, may be one of the factors why public opinion about China has improved somewhat? So I see in your description here you, you pick up you know, the good news of, of Chiang Lei's release, um, the um, decision by Beijing to remove some of its unilateral trade sanctions. Um, but of course, in the same period, um, Yang Hongjun has been sentenced to death. Um, there's been the multiple incidents where the Royal Australian Navy has been coerced. Um, there's obviously in the background, there's China's co uh, coercive actions in the region, the, the buildup of their forces, the PLA, and including their military forces. So do you think it, it, one of the factors in the way the public is perceiving the China-Australia relationship is the way we're presenting the China-Australia relationship to them? Yeah, if you're, if you're talking about the polling, um, what we try to avoid doing is educating the public or trying to give them um, you know, a sense of the context. We, we keep our um, longitudinal questions very, um, very, as, as, as uh, constant as possible. So when it comes to China, um, the question about trust has been the same every year. How much do you see, uh, how much trust do you have in China to do the, the right thing? And that hasn't changed over the, the course of the poll. So I, I don't think that's as affected by um, by framing. What you might be referring to in the poll report is sort of what we've tried to analyse a bit around the context of, of those results. Um, but but if you're talking about the way that um, leaders um, frame the relationship, then then I think yeah, absolutely, it, it matters. It makes a difference. But I'd also point to that there are um, there are, there are underlying drivers of how the public perceive China, and it wasn't. Um, it wasn't necessarily how leaders talked about the economic coercion from China, but the fact that it happened and that there were large numbers of, you know, huge amounts of Australian exports that were blocked over the over several years. So there are there I think um, there are there are underlying factors. Media and leaders might play into that, might exacerbate certain aspects of it. Um, but uh, I, I think part of the the dive in public opinion towards China was uh, largely a result of those actions, those coercive actions. I can say from long experience, the, the exact wording of questions is a subject of intense discussion inside the Lowy Institute every year before we, uh, before we go out to the field with this poll. Um, who, who's got another question for us? Please raise your hand. And yes, in the second row over here. Jia Yen from uh, Australian Public Service. Xiao will not be surprised by the question I'm about to ask, which is on free trade. Um, looking at the, uh, the free trade results, um, it seems to be quite counterintuitive almost looking at the year-by-year -year increase in the uh, level of support for free trade amongst the Australian community when considering the commentary over the last couple of years around uh, the fact that trade can you know, expose vulnerabilities um, to things like trade blockages with China, COVID-19, uh, supply chain issues um, and of course looking down the bottom of your report there it says that it, the strong report for free trade coexists with support for subsidies and support for <laughs> French shoring and uh, and uh, French shoring supply chains and of course in the context of governments future made in Australia so those seem to sit uncomfortably those results as well as with the commentary what might explain the persistent strong support for free trade which is good for trade policy officials I might say but <laughs> be interested to, to hear. Oh, well, thanks for the, the question, Gia. I, mean, I think, um, you know, it's one of those instances, once again, where we see um, disparity between um, result, uh, the results uh, across a, a range of areas. I mean, I think, you know, um, that there's been consistent, uh, fairly consistent support for free trade amongst Australians over the, the life of the poll. And I think most Australians um, have recognised the benefits that a free trading system uh, allows us. But I think um, as you know, the China results, the India results and other results show, people also recognise that we're in an increasingly complex world where um, the, the free trade uh, system is not necessarily operating according to the rules-based order. And so there's a need to you know, think about how we sort of manage uh, our sort of economic and uh, resilience and uh, national security going forward. And so, 
you know, the, I think that um, support for supply chain diversification is sort of a reflection of, of that um, as well. So, um, I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's been very interesting across many subject areas of the poll that um, Australians are, are open to um, having their cake and eating it too. <laughs> so. uh, yes, in the back there. Thanks very much. <clears throat> I'm a local person. I'm Sam Wong here. And uh, I come here all the time and listen to wonderful things. And also, congratulations for the Lowell Institute. For many polls, you guys done a wonderful job. I was a good friend with Frank many years ago. And him and I and many others supported the establishment for the SBS TV and radio program. And Frank did a tremendous job to argue or support to get the government to get it going. Therefore, recognition to Frank forever from the multicultural community point of view. My question is actually go back to page 30. In 30, this is about the Australian government performance. Now, there was a very good diagram there. About 30, or well, actually is 49% confirm that the government in foreign policy do a good job. And then you got 7%. Excellent job. But the rest, now this is interesting, is over 40% they don't support it. Now I just, with the ministers here, <laughs> I'm just wondering what's your reflection to that because you mentioned that I support it. You're wonderful, engaging with community. You talk to thousands of people about things in general, including foreign policy. Now, with this survey result, how does it reflect that the current Australian policy. Interesting enough, any other department, perhaps except Defence and PMNC, would go out and talk to people about what people think. And I'm sorry, I've been living here for so many years. I never heard of anybody go and ask for foreign policy, go to the community and say, what do you think? Now, is it about time we've got to change or there are some other ways to engage the community for reflection of that result? Thank you very much indeed. I can, I can have a crack at that. I mean, if you look over the page, uh, just on your first part of your question, sir, about the, uh, the, the government's um, foreign policy performance. So, yes, it, it's broadly divided, uh, half saying that the government's done a, an okay job at foreign policy. If you want to break down why uh, that is, I think look at the government report card where we actually ask about specific issues and, and you can get a sense then of where... Th people think the government's done better and where it's done worse. Up the top of the list, people say that uh, maintaining the, the Labor government's done a great job at maintaining a strong alliance with the United States. Down the bottom, responding to the Israel-Hamas war, managing approach to climate change gets lower points. So there's there's um, a bit, bit more granularity there if you're seeking to understand where people mark the government higher and lower. Um, but when it comes to uh, you know public consultation, maybe I could just sort of go back to my role, previous role as a public servant, um, you know, part of what DFAT uh, has tried to do for a long, long period of time is um, speak to the public, try to understand where public wants foreign and trade and development policy to go. There's actually a little known um, network of state and territory officers which are charged with doing exactly that. I used to work in one and they've almost embassies to that uh, the people of that state. Um, now, uh, you could argue that there's more to be done in terms of communicating with the public and understanding where they want to um, where they want foreign policy to go, um, but there is that intent there, and there is um, an investment in in uh, in that effort. Okay, one last comment. It appears to be probably not foreign affairs and trade, but perhaps this is not only foreign affairs and trade, but I'm talking about other government departments, including defence and prime minister and cabinet. They look for outside consultants. Some I don't want to name the institutions in general, but it seems to be they are lopsided. Always one side is right, one side is wrong. And you guys paying them lots of money and receiving their advice. Now, that's okay. That's your determination. But as a taxpayer or p little people like me, for example, how could we feed back to you guys to have a more balanced view about the whole matter before you make a considered decision in foreign policy? Thank you. I would just, um, in response to that, say that, you know, this is the, firstly that the Lowy Institute is an independent think tank, that we're not part of government. 
um, but also that you know the the, the Lowy Institute poll is a um, a long running and excellent uh, sort of viewpoint of what Australians think on on public policy issues, and that was exactly why it was created because you know I absolutely agree with you that it is really important to understand what Australians are thinking about issues, and that sometimes the loudest voices in the room are not reflective of what most people think about foreign policy. And so, you know, the poll, I think, does a, a really um, fantastic job of, of looking at a very broad spectrum of public policy issues and how people's perceptions are changing over time. And, you know, I hate to kind of to buy into the Canberra bubble jargon, but, you know, to think, you know, what are Australians thinking broadly outside the Canberra bubble? Right, indeed. We have time for one or two more. And we haven't, ah, now there's a hand up there about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Woodbury, Royal Australian Navy. My question is about Pacific Islands and similarly to the, my Aspie colleague about Australia's presentation of the narrative of China in the Pacific Islands. I note on page 16 that nine out of 10 Australians were very concerned about China potentially opening a military base in the Pacific Islands and that they perceive that China has significantly more influence than Australia. Now, the statistics actually show that Australia maintains a position as a security partner of choice in the Pacific Islands. So the question, I guess, is that, is it perhaps that there's the narrative in Australia that Australian public are aware of is actually not correct? And I'll case this with an example of last month, we had one of the most uh, combative combatively powerful Chinese maritime platforms present in the Pacific Islands at the Tonga Fleet Review. That was widely reported across Australian uh, news agencies. But at the same time, we also had the Australian DPAP program with the C-17s being signed off. We had ADF forces in Solomon Islands for SIAF efforts. We had an Australian warship in the Pacific alongside the US. And that to me just didn't seem to be presented in the same uh, with the same intensity. So I wonder if that skews the statistics a little bit and if you can comment on that. Yeah, look on the response on uh, which country wields the most influence in the Pacific. I think it's clear that China does um, occupy an outsized role in how the Australian public can, can considers security in the region. And uh, I mean, that question is not just about security, it's also about influence, whether it's political, economic, people can take that in different ways. But I think the point you're making is that there, there's a lot happening when it comes to Australia's role with Pacific Island countries on the security front. We are a, a partner of choice for many of those countries. When it comes to the economic front, we are the largest aid donor in the region still. We provide a lot of um, official finance. Uh, and we are a resident member of the Pacific Islands Forum, so we're in the region. So, so the, the, the public don't necessarily clock uh, the whole gamut of activities that are happening, but what they have latched onto and what it does seem registers in, registers in this poll is that the, the, the worry about China's presence in the Pacific, which um, there's been effort, there's been intentionality, we've seen efforts to open, uh, to establish military or policing presences in some of the Pacific Island countries, that comes through the media, that filters through the public um, consciousness, and that does uh, tend to, to, I think, play into the results here. Um, so that's, uh, I'd, I'd agree that I, I think there are, um, that not, the, the results don't necessarily reflect the role that Australia has, but I think there's also um, good reasons for why we, we see uh, how that result has played out. Now we have only time uh, for the two of you just uh, to offer some brief wrapping up comments. Any broad observations that you want to finish with? Shell, can I start with you? Yeah, uh, well, thanks, Sam. I think um, I have two uh, brief observations to make. Uh, and the first would be that, you know, there has never been a more important time for the Lowy poll uh, to be sort of uh, in operation. Uh, we're in a very sort of fractured uh, global landscape. And, you know, there are lots of complex is issues that policymakers, the media, uh, governments are, are trying to, to grapple with at the moment. And so it is important to understand, you know, what people are thinking about some of these key issues, but to understand that it's a snapshot and actually you often need to also, you know, drill down into sort of the data um, in, in deeper ways. And I know that I've sent um, 
a couple of uh, ANU academic friends sort of um, small avenues where I said, this is a, an interesting drill down in tourism. Maybe you might like to um, look at this further um, potentially. Um, and then the second thing I would say is that, you know, in all of the areas that I was kind of speaking to tonight, I was interested that, you know, there was sort of a real um, sort of incongruence between many of the statements um, that people were making. So, you know, Australians want strong action on climate change internationally. They don't want to pay much for it at, at home if possible. You know, we uh, support the ANZUS Alliance, but we don't want to be drawn into a war in Asia that's not in our national interest. Um, free and trade. Free trade, uh, again. And so I think, you know, this really speaks to the, the very complex trade-offs that we now face in the world. And, you know, that means that, you know, uh, policymakers, the media um, and, and governments uh, really need to, to be thinking about how they manage uh, those trade-offs and how they communicate effectively with the public um, in, in telling those stories and why they're taking the paths that they've taken. Thank you, Shell and Ryan. As the author of the poll, you get the last word. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll riff off Shell. I think um, interpretation of the results is important, at, almost as important as how we write the questions, right? And, um, you know, the headlines always grab a lot of attention that views on China have plummeted, uh, that Australians support free trade, they are wary of, um, of war in our region. But looking at the detail also matters in polling. And when you look at some of the demographic splits, that's where you get some important clues into where um, sections of the population see things going. So just to illustrate that in a couple of um, sh quick examples, on immigration, there's more support for um, immigration amongst young people. On the economy, there's less optimism amongst young people uh, on, on uh, the economy going forward. On climate change, younger uh, age brackets want to see uh, or see climate change as a more pressing and urgent issue. And on democracy, this one's interesting, on democracy, uh, younger Australians are less likely to say that democracy is preferable than any other form of government. So there's a whole bunch of things which we can mull over, um, but care and nuance in interpreting the results is, is key. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being here. And I apologise we didn't get to all of your questions, but uh, I, it, it has been a very fruitful and fascinating discussion. Could you please thank our panellists?